right size room next time if we have another meeting. Um, uh, you also use this to get in and out of the queue um, to speak at the microphone. You'll scan it with your uh, phone. <clears throat> we do have a, a, um, a printed page in case you can't, don't want to get up. I can start sending this around. All right, cool. What? All right, it's one minute after. Let's go ahead and get this party started. Um, hey, uh, this is the Detecting Unwanted Location Tracker, Birds of a Feather. Um, welcome. Also, could somebody uh, grab the back door and close it for me? Um, really appreciate that, thanks. You can slide in. All right, so going on. This is the IETF note well. It's Thursday, hopefully you may have seen this before, but if you're an IETF newcomer, this is uh, basically kind of a reminder if you're participating, you have to follow the rules and processes of the IETF. Um, and there's a whole lot of them. There are a lot of them are listed there in the BCP that kind of explains the standardization process, you know, how the working group things. There's some other things about anti-harassment and code of conduct, copyright patents and disclosures. And that's one thing I guess you know I can kind of raise here is that if you if you're going to participate, IE talk, be here, do anything, and you know about IPR that likes this, you need to disclose it. Uh, uh, some other minor housekeeping bits. Uh, this is kind of how you run the meeting. The meet echo. There's one. There's an in-person participants to make sure you log into the session, scan the QR code. Again, it makes sure that we get the right and appropriately sized room if we're going to meet again. Um, you're also going to use this to join the line, the, the mic line, the queue, so it's, uh, that we can better work with remote participants. And I know that we have a number, actually. Um, and uh, if you're local, you don't need to turn your audio on um, or your video on, please. For remote participants, you should make sure you, your audio and video are turned off unless you're actually talking or presenting. Um, and we'd really like you to use a headset. It cuts down a lot of the reverb. Uh, there's some buttons to press. Uh, if you're in the if you're in the the uh, ITF agenda, you can find the buttons, click them, use them. Great. I keep hitting the wrong button. Okay. Session details. Our agenda has been posted for a couple days. Uh, slides were updated at like this morning. So if you if you need to go click a button to refresh, please do that to make sure you have the latest set. Um, chairs. I'm Sean Turner. Alyssa Cooper over here to my right. Um, and this is uh, intended to be a working group forming buff. And then our basic agenda is the chairs doing a little bit of talking and then we're gonna have Eric, Erica Olson do a problem statement. We're gonna have, we're gonna have a bunch of uh, people talk about um, how the deploy systems work and use cases from a number of different vendors. And then we're gonna have a quick talk about the threat model. Um, scope of the charter proposal, and then most of the discussion we want to spend talking about the charter discussion, and then at the end, uh, Alyssa will 
close up with the, the actual both questions. And we'll be running using the show of hands tool. So that's another reason why you need to make sure you sign into the data tracker um, for the session. Um, are we at the point where we have Erica online and ready to roll? Not yet. Okay, cool. We're uh, in the process of working on that. Sorry, we had a little bit of a snafu glitch, but we're working on it. So I will. Uh, yeah, I mean, we can, you know. Okay, all right. I think let me uh, stop, pull the slides up, and then we'll be pressing some buttons because I feel like this is going to work. Since we can't get along, why don't we flash up the slides so that people can read it? Yeah. Just kind of take us over. Yeah. Then we can keep going with the assistant members out here, and we'll be back for you to give her the voiceover. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You left. Sorry, we're doing some last, last second uh, granting of rights here. Yeah, while the chairs are working on it, just to kind of explain, we have a remote participant. We're just, there's some remote comms issues. We're trying to sort it out. Thanks. Let me send Out of uh, just just out of curiosity, can I have a show of hands of who are new participants to the ITF? Okay, I mean that's like a third of you. All right. Can you, do we know where, where Brent went? Yeah, he stepped out for a second, all right. Um, well, this is, there, there he is. Uh, Brent, we're having some uh, technical difficulties. Do you mind pinch hitting the uh, problem statement? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Pa apologies. I'm awake now. We're typing things from Slack into email to put into Meet Echo. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. You okay to do um, it? I haven't reviewed really them. So. All right. Well, you know a whole lot about this, so I'd say we broke. The other thing we could do is I could give a brief intro ahead of it in terms of just the overall effort. Do we think that she's going to go the long way? Yeah, yeah, so basically, I think so. I think it's just so she needs to register over she likes, and then yeah. Um, so go ahead. Just need to use the waiver for, for yeah. and then she can. Yeah. Uh, as soon as she's registered, you can log into data tracker and yeah. access okay. the session. That's a good point. We could do the problem statement second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's right. kind of where. Let's do that. Yeah. Okay. I can do an intro. Okay. Can we maybe jump to your side? Slide on my slide. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. where I'm going. And then is this? Yep. You can be a rock star if you want. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, I guess we've announced we have technical difficulties, so we're going to do a little bit of a change up, and Erica is going to be here very soon. Uh, so thank you. Thank you for attending. I'm really thrilled to be here. This is my first ever IETF. Uh, I'm thrilled also to have the discussion today with the IETF community about detecting unwanted location trackers. I think, as you'll see today, there is some unique attributes of this problem from the Bluetooth side to the internet connectivity side to 
uh, privacy and security challenges that I believe the IETF community is uniquely positioned to do a great job tackling this work. Um, Erica is gonna talk about this a ton and I'm gonna try to be really slow. So she has plenty of time to log on and talk about it, but I wanna underscore what she's gonna say in a minute, that this is a near and present safety problem. Um, we're, we're very aware that the current solutions out there for detecting unwanted tracking are uh, stovepiped at best, provide some solutions to some people running some devices, but there's no universal solution that is cross-platform, cross-accessory that allows for true interoperability to help protect as many people as possible. So that's the goal of, of this work and what we're going to discuss today um, at length. Um, when we get to, how much more time do I have? You should just go. <laughs> you should just give yourself. Okay. Yeah. You want me to just go through? Okay. Oh, great, 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 great. Okay. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is is um, uh, the the kind of large scale problem of protecting people against unwanted tracking. There's a big part of it's going to talk about the detecting unwanted location trackers and what you do about that. But this actually starts a little bit sooner. Uh, at the beginning of of sorry pairing an accessory for the first time. There's an opportunity to deter someone against misuse of this product, educate them that maybe this is an illegal activity in some places, and, and maybe even collect a pairing registry to help with attribution at a later time. Then getting into the next phase, which we'll talk a lot more about, background scanning to show proactive alerts if something unknown to you is traveling with you. Doing that in a cross-platform, cross-accessory, interoperable way is, will be fantastic. Showing on that alert um, meaningful information, like the image of what's tracking you. You may not know, be familiar with the product, uh, the make and model of it, maybe also instructions uh, or video on how to disable it if you need to disable it. Another aspect to this is just physically finding it. So before you can disable it, you need to physically find it. You could find it via play sound, maybe UDB finding or Bluetooth RSSI finding. These are all parts that are very critical to providing as much protection as possible for people. Sorry, I'm trying try to reshare this again. It, it, it's crapping out on me. There, come on. Can you want to present the PDF? Ah, uh, yeah. Unbelievable. Right. Can I do that? I mean, it's in the desktop. Yeah. Unable to connect to the server, trying to connect. Oh. <laughs> God. <laughs> All right, I'm logging out and I'm logging back in. It's crapping out on me. Okay. I'm sorry. It, it literally just barred. Uh, okay. You want me to try? Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, maybe we need to stop sharing. Or... Yeah, I'm not there. <laughs> Hold on. I'm calling. Oh, I guess the page you were looking for couldn't be found. That's awesome. I can ask a question for the audience in the meantime uh, to both, entertain we're you. Both having data tracker connectivity problems, apparently. Um, so. Could could I see a raise of hands of who's familiar with an unwanted tracking alert? Well, that's about half. That's great. Oh goodness. <laughs> Hold on. Oh, you, you're doing I, it? I think it's okay. coming back. Okay. Ooh, apologies. Okay. Next. There we go. Sorry. Great. Uh, okay. So now we're going to talk a little about the system architecture for existing systems, both from the location crowdsourcing aspect 
and also for unwanted tracking detection systems. This has been abstracted a little bit and generalized. Um, so because there's multiple systems out there, but hopefully it's educational and helpful enough so you understand how these systems work. Next slide, please. Um, so we're gonna start slow and build in. Um, some of these concepts might, might be new to some of you. So the first concept I wanna um, educate you on is what we call near owner mode. There's two modes primarily that tags um, operate in. Near, near owner mode is the mode that's in after you've completed Bluetooth pairing uh, between an owner phone and the owner's tag. It's near owner here in the sense that it's physically close to the, the, the phone and the tag are physically close together. Physically close here is defined as within Bluetooth operating range. The reason this mode is relevant will become, uh, make more sense in the next slide when we contrast it with separated mode. Next slide, please. So in separated mode, the tag is physically far away from the owner's phone or owner's devices. Uh, of course, in physically far here is defined as within outside of Bluetooth operating range. Uh, of course, this also the tag could be in this mode if the phone is powered off or its battery has died, but the nominal case is it's physically far away. In this case, because it's far away, you want to enable crowdsourcing. It's relevant to understand the location of accessory when it's far away. When it's close to you in nearby near owner mode, uh, crowdsourcing doesn't matter because it's physically close to you. So let's go to the, oh, um, yeah, let's go to the next slide. Great. Um, so building on, a building on top of separated mode is uh, the crowd an example of how the crowdsourcing network works. So again, the tag and the phone are physically far apart in this example. There are three finders, uh, phones, uh, laptops, uh, watches, whatever, that are operating on the same crowdsourcing network. Uh, the way this works is they uh, typically works um, is they observe the Bluetooth advertisement from the tag. That advertisement is formatted in a way or has information that says, uh, I want to be crowdsourced. Furthermore, there, there has to be ideally some sort of key, ideally a rotating diversified public key or something like that, that uh, as it rotates over time um, and each finder gets a new key, it's gonna take that key along with the finder's location, the phone's location, so three separate devices here, encrypt that location with that key and then publish both the key and that location to the server. Then when the owner's phone wants to know, hey, where's my tag right now? Uh, we'll query the server for the, the, the set of keys that are valid at that time and maybe in the recent past, pull down all the records from the server associated with those keys, decrypt the locations because there's a maybe a private diversified set of keys that the owner's device has too, and then compute the best possible location from the set of uh, locations that have been retrieved. Next, I'm going to hand over to Tajinder, who's online. Can you hear me? Yep. So yeah, so uh, one of the most important aspects about tags and their usage is also to prevent the unwanted tracking. And in this slide, we'll cover an overview architecture on how we detect the unwanted trackers and notify the users of potential tracking. Um, as the non-owner travels with the tag, their phone is running the background Bluetooth scans to identify any unknown accessories. Uh, the non-owner's phone keeps tracks of the MAC addresses of the trackers that have been seen in a separated state. And if a tracker is in a separated state, uh, seen continuously seen over the multiple, multiple Bluetooth scans over a period of time and distance, the non-owner will receive the alert. Now, one of the key aspects to note here is we only send the alerts for the tags which are in a separated state. This is to minimize the false positives and also like as Brent mentioned, like there is a notion that when the device, when the tag is actually connected to the user's device, the rotation of the MAC address is quite frequent. And while they are in a separated state, the tag is rotated less frequently to assist for the unknown tracking. Um, so once a tag is deemed or detected as an unknown tag, the non-owner is alerted by a notification. The alert provides the details about the tag, such as the image, serial number, et cetera. Um, it also provides a mechanism to ring the tag in order to locate it and further instructions on how to disable the tag, remove batteries, et cetera. Um, with this, I'll hand it over back to Brent to further continue. Thank you. Cool, thanks to Jinder. Can we go to the next slide, please? Yes. 
Great. So uh, this is an overall system architecture that brings together those two concepts of BT crowdsourcing and unwanted tracking detection that Tejinder just spoke about. We're going to refer back to this when we have a discussion about the scope of the proposed working group. I think this highlights a number of the interfaces and protocols that are relevant um, and should be in scope within the, the, the charter and some that should not be. So just want to name those particular interfaces and protocols right now because we're going to revisit them later. In no particular order, item A is the Bluetooth advertisement that comes from the accessory. Uh, item B is the, uh, the publishing of the encrypted locations to a server. Item C is the uh, pulling down those encrypted locations from the owner device, uh, from the server to the owner device. Item D in the upper right is the, um, uh, the protocol for over Bluetooth to query information about the accessory, the make and model, et cetera, its capabilities. Does it support play sound or UDB finding or some other finding capability? And also issue commands to the accessory to say start play, uh, playing sound. And finally, interface or protocol E is querying a server for ancillary information, things like the image uh, for the accessory text description on how to disable it, maybe a video on how to disable it. These are things that are too big to normally store on the accessory itself and impractical to build into all the, the operating systems or apps. Furthermore, there's a potentially a separate protocol for serial number lookup that happens over the internet too. Cool. So we're going to break now and go back to Erica. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to switch over to Erica's slides. All right. Great. Um, I, Erica, go ahead. Hi. Are you able to hear me? Uh, I got a green mark. Is your? Can you turn your video on? There we go. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are you able to hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you. It's giving me a little audio problem. Uh, so, all right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for, um, for inviting me to join um, and, and bring a little bit of our contacts as we're looking at this issue. Um, my name is Eric Olson. I'm the Senior uh, Director of the Safety Net Project at the National Network on Domestic Violence. Um, and um, I'm going to be talking just a moment about the, the problem statement, the, the problem issue that we're seeing um, that we're hoping can be addressed. Um, Bluetooth tracking uh, trackers are being misused, as I know you all know. Uh, they're being misused as a tactic of abuse to perpetrate harassment, stalking, theft, uh, domestic violence, and, and sexual assault. Uh, and we see um, our concern is about our ability to be in control of our location privacy and our location information um, by the time someone finds that they have a tag uh, or a, 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 sorry, I'm a little flustered trying to get it in, trying to get in um, and get my mind back to this. Um, by the time that somebody finds that there is a device that has been tracking them um, with the current uh, design and the current standard, it, there's already exists a critical safety issue for many, many people. Um, and the lack of standardized design right now and implementation of the, of the devices um, really allows for and facilitates this wide misuse uh, and creates significant safety concerns, especially for victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. Move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So location tracking in the context of domestic violence, sexual assault and stalking, location tracking is a incredibly common uh, form of abuse and tactic of abuse that is not at all specific to Bluetooth trackers. It has been a tactic of abuse for a very long time. Um, anyone who's been doing this work um, uh, addressing domestic violence, sexual assault, stalking and working with victims of crime um, knows that. Um, I remember when odometers 
where it was something that um, abusers would keep track of and just kind of watch the mileage of a car to see if somebody had um, veered off and gone somewhere else during their day than their normal route. Um, so the, the concept of location tracking is one that any service provider working with victims of crime is very well attuned to. Um, the difference that exists now is the um, the accuracy, the real time ability for somebody to be able to identify someone else's location and to find them often without any notification or information to the victim that this might be happening until uh, obviously until it can be too late. Um, their location has been compromised, which in many situations for survivors can be someplace they fled to, including a confidential domestic violence shelter. Um, location and safety are critically linked for survivors, and so from the perspective of advocates who are doing this work, we know really well what the research says, and for decades, um, the research has said very clearly that at the point that somebody s tries to start planning to leave and leaves an abusive person, the, that piece right there of planning to leave and actually leaving is the height of the of the most the most dangerous potential time. It is the time when the most murders happen of victims of violence and um, the children involved in any relationships. It is also the time when stalking behaviors um, and assaults um, increase. Um, and behaviors, abusive behaviors tend to escalate. So that particular time when somebody is planning to leave and leaving is a real significant piece that all victim service providers try to really wrap around survivors and help them plan to safely leave. And what we're seeing is uh, increasing challenges to that ability to, to plan safely for fleeing a, a, an abusive person. <clears throat> Ted I, Ted, I see you're in the queue. Is it all right if we hold yours, uh, your, your comments to the end? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm sure everybody here has already seen there's been plenty of media coverage. And um, so it, the, this is not um, a brand new topic, I'm sure, uh, as it relates to Bluetooth technology. Um, but these pieces I put in here, like, question mark if it's helpful. Um, the, the issue is that without a better um, standardized universal response to detection, to alerts, to let people and survivors know of tracking before they already realize they're being tracked, somebody knows too much, they found them, um, without something like that, all of this media and coverage tends to be a little bit more informative to abusive individuals than actually to survivors. Um, it's very helpful that there are some safeguards and we applauded um, Apple's um, um, the, the design to automatically uh, from launch include some safeguards um, into the into air tags, for example, um, but we don't believe that that is enough um, at all. And I can talk a little bit more about why in the next slide. So what we are seeing across the country um, and even internationally with some of our sister projects that we have um, is both victim service providers and um, survivors are reporting actual misuse. This is not just a, uh, a question of a concern for safety. This is happening. Um, we have been seeing it for a long time. Um, trackers have been found in the lining of purses and bags and, um, and jackets. Um, and we've found uh, in programs, I should say, local domestic violence advocates have found trackers even inside um, toys. There was one shelter that found a tracker uh, sewn inside the teddy bear of a little kid whose um, parent flew, fled to, um, to a shelter. Um, we've all heard probably of the of the the cases, the lawsuits that have made the news. But on a um, day to day basis, this is something that advocates and service providers are seeing, and they're trying to work around with survivors, and they're really struggling with that. Uh, next slide. Thank you. Uh, so the challenge for survivors with this is that you know there are a lot of ways 
that that location can be tracked. Um, in today's age, there's a, a significantly a growing list of ways that abusers can track down and identify somebody's location and find somebody. Um, and so the, it becomes incredibly overwhelming, especially at a very um, critical time when somebody is experiencing a lot of trauma and a lot of stress. It's very hard to think straight. And the current the current design that people will download different apps to try to find and detect different types of um, trackers is incredibly burdensome and problematic and just not a reasonable expectation for people who are not in a stressful situation. Um, I recently traveled um, with an unwanted tracker on me um, that was owned by somebody else. I was keeping it on me so that I could test um, some of the, the um, existing apps. And there's one that I used to uh, see if I could find the tracker. And it showed up with a, um, a screen that said, no trackers found, you're safe, exclamation point. Um, even though I was sitting, uh, I did this scan many, many times and never detected the unwanted tracker that was with me um, within a foot of where I was at every single scan. Um, but the, the idea that not only is it not finding the tracker when it says that it's going to, but that I actually get a notice on my phone that says, you're safe, is really problematic. It sets a false sense of security for survivors, and it sends them down a rabbit hole of trying to figure out other possibilities for how the person's finding their location um, when it still actually could be a tracker. Um, so there's a real need for um, universal standards and design to address this issue. Um, we also hear all the time that shelters, especially those that are confidential location shelters, are really struggling to figure out how to address this. They are, i seen situations where survivors are coming into a shelter, they find um, location trackers in their bags, in their belongings that the survivor didn't know was there. And then the shelter is concerned not only about that one individual safety and the abuser coming after them, but they're then concerned about the safety of everyone at the shelter. And so they are figuring out how to handle that. And many shelters have to pay out um, to try to put the shel the, that survivor in a hotel um, or figure out an alternative for them. Um, so these are these are significant concerns and all reasons why we are hoping to see a much more um, robust universal process um, to handle unwanted tracking. Ted. Uh, Ted Hardy, thank you very much for uh, going through the importance of this matter. And I think the audience here is uh, well informed by it. I wanted to go back to uh, one of the points you made earlier, which is this is one of a, a field of location tracker issues, right? That uh, the Bluetooth location trackers are among other location trackers. And one of the most significant of those is tracking of uh, a target's phone. Um, and it's, it's uh, my experience, no, not my experience, it is my understanding uh, that one of the most common things to happen is a stalker or potential abuser uh, will compromise a phone uh, of the person they wish to stalk in order to install tracking software or otherwise uh, prevent the person from hiding their location from the abuser. The proposed architecture here uh, because it is based on a detection by phones, will require um, somebody who wants to understand if there are unwanted Bluetooth trackers to have a phone uh, that yeah. performs that function. Is that acceptable uh, as a core design principle given that risk? That's a, that's a really excellent question. Um, so I think that one of the things you're talking about, there's a number of ways that people, uh, abusers manipulate um, and, and abuse the, somebody's phone as a tactic to try to find them. Um, one um, thing you might be talking about is um, the use of stalkerware. Um, I think with the cover, the media coverage around stalkerware and the level of concern that we have seen, you almost get a sense that it happens a lot more frequently than it actually does. Um, stalkerware is a concern, and that is a complete um, uh, manipulation of the device, putting something on the device, installing software um, that the the device owner would have no 
notice, no information about it even being there, but the other person is able to see everything that's happening on the device. Um, anything outside of stalkerware is usually a lot more um, easy for a service provider and a survivor to work through and to identify. Stalkerware is the biggest concern um, that is that is incredibly challenging to uh, navigate. However, that said, it's also um, much more unlikely to ha actually be something that somebody is misusing. Um, there are some, there's a clinic at, and tech abuse at Cornell and a couple other clinics that um, specifically have been designed to help individualized um, uh, tech support with survivors to identify stalkerware and other types of tech misuse. And over and over and over again, they have found that a number of times people think that stalkerware might be on their device, but the abuser is actually finding their information through another means. Um, and overall, we hear about Bluetooth location trackers, these devices that are being placed in belongings, um, in uh, actually but actually having at a much greater extent than um, the stalkerware. Um, and so there is going to be a concern, of course, if there's stalkerware on a device, that the abuser would be alerted to anything that's happening on that device. But it is it is absolutely something that we can navigate around in terms of that process of individualizing the safety plan with person. Um, and you can, if you have another device, a very, very common suggestion uh, for survivors who are concerned about the abuser misusing their technology is to get another device um, that the abuser isn't aware of and doesn't know about. So if you have another device with you that's um, getting proactive, you know, and the design is made so that there's proactive alerts, then that would there would still be avenues for a better design to alert somebody that would not conflict with um, a, a concern around um, stalkerware. Um, I hope that makes sense, but we, would, we, we do work with survivors when they are concerned about both location tracking, for example, and stalkerware. We would work with survivors and programs every day or working with survivors to identify alternative devices that would allow them to do that scan um, or to have a different device on them to receive a proactive alert that would not be the same device. Um, and I think that that would be, we would still really, really want to see a universal design um, that helps with this issue, even if stalkerware continues to exist. Uh, thank you for that response. I, it does seem like this issue will need to be considered as well uh, for people who do not have access to a phone, like small children, uh, especially given the point you made about somebody sewing it into a child's toy. Um, I, I think as a core piece of this design, uh, the group should consider carefully whether there um, is uh, a dependency here on a particular type of device being available to do the detection, as well as the dependency on a particular network, um, like uh, Bluetooth low energy versus other kinds of um, uh, available networking. Thank you. We're going to close the queue. So if you want to be in the queue for the problem statement section, you have a minute to get there. Kathleen Moriarty, uh, Center for Internet Security. So I've been looking at this for a while. And first, I'll commend you for documenting your solution set and pushing towards a standard. It's extremely helpful to understand what you're doing under the hood. One of my observations, and I think it will be helpful to this discussion and the problem statement, is that we have very unique use cases. and my look at it over the last year is that they are distinct, right? And that we very narrowly focus on the use case relevant to this discussion. And Ted brought up some of those points. Um, you know, in this case, we're tracking a device that's yours. We're preventing surveillance. Then there's other vendors who have proprietary solutions who are tracking stolen items. It's handled differently and they're using different means to deter that type of activity by placing large fines and uh, tight identity ties. I think it's too difficult to try to scope all those together and you can't force people to implement a standard. Um, and then the other one is children and elderly. I have a parent with dementia and my siblings have mentioned a number of times using you know, one of these type devices, but there are devices specifically designed for those use cases. So I, 
I think treating these as separate use cases, they might be acknowledged, would be a lot easier. Francois? Good morning, Francois Nguyen. Um, I was about to make a comment up very similar to that one, the, the use cases of tracking my, chi my children. And um, if someone steals my car and I put the track on my car, the whole point was to track my car. Uh, then they are notified that they are with my car and they can remove it. So that defeats the purpose. Thank you. Okay. Eva Galperin, EFF. Sorry, just, we closed the queue. We yeah. Okay. Thank you for your patience. I just want to push back against the idea that somehow we cannot do this because tracking your stolen goods or tracking your children or tracking the elderly uh, without them being able to detect it is necessary. Um, in the end, uh, tracking your children with them being able to detect it is just fine. Uh, tracking the elderly with them knowing that they are being tracked is just fine. Tracking uh, stolen, uh, your stolen property with them knowing that it's being tracked is suboptimal if you would like to come and get your stolen property back. But I'm just gonna come out there and say it, that if you create a tracker which tracks your stolen property but does not uh, alert the thief, then you are creating a stalking device and there is absolutely no way around that and in the end, people are simply more important than property. Just to clarify, I didn't say what you think I said. So I was just saying, let's focus on a use case. I wasn't, okay. I was not, and I was supportive of the effort. Oh, okay, okay, thanks. Okay. Thanks for tolerating a little bit of the agenda rearranged. So Brent's going to finish up and then we'll move to Jocelyn. Great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so sorry about jumping around a bit. This uh, one of the questions that came up in the um, e uh, email group was how do existing systems compare today? This is not a complete and thorough comparison, but it is a summary of uh, four systems and at least on some dimensions across the columns, how they compare. Uh, hopefully this is, is educational. So the way I'm going to describe this, I'll go through the columns and make sure people have a good sense of what those mean, and then describe the OS level solutions and the app level solutions that I called out here. So in the columns, um, the first one, uh, deterrence at pairing. Again, I've mentioned this a few times. First opportunity to educate someone that, that misuse of a location tracker can be very problematic, if not illegal. Um, also creates an opportunity to store something like a pairing registry to have attribution between the individual that paired it and the, the specific item that um, uh, could be misused. The next one is uh, proactive alerts. I think this is really critical to not have us to not just have a solution where you have to manly, uh, even worse, download a bunch of apps and then manly press a bunch of buttons to look for something around you. Um, having your phone uh, or an app working in the background to help you determine if something is traveling with you and you're not having to do anything yourself is critical. Um, this requires background Bluetooth scanning, of course, and a number of other things where we've already talked about and will talk about. Um, you need to learn more about the accessories. Some people may not know what a, you know, what a tile is, what an AirTag is, what a Chipolo is. So having the make and model, an image of it, some text description is really helpful. And then of course, you, you typically need to find it. Either that's play sound, uh, U2B finding, Bluetooth RSSI finding, there's a number of techniques there. And then finally, um, you may want to get the serial number. It could be printed on the product. That, of course, could be easily damaged or destroyed. Need an electronic means to get the serial number, too, in the case where you want to go back to the company that provided it or potentially law enforcement to um, follow up. Now, talking through the columns, um, there's two uh, operating, level, operating system level solutions, the one from Apple, the one from Google. Uh, you know, I'm not going to go through the specific check marks there, but lots of green, at least on these columns. There are definitely more columns than these, but for this set of uh, important columns, lots of green, that's good. The downside to those solutions is what's called out in the far right. Which accessories do they support today? Uh, Apple's system supports first and third party accessories on Apple's finding network. 
Google Solution supports uh, third-party accessories on Google's network. In addition, they've done some special bespoke work to add AirTag support for that. Um, going down to the app level solutions, there's just two here. I think Jocelyn's gonna talk a lot more about the bottom one, so I'll just talk about AirGuard, a commonly used um, app from uh, a research group in Germany used to detect location trackers. It has some attributes that are great. It, man it primarily works on manually scanning, but it has some ability to do proactive alerts, alerting um, from the background, but that's a little bit more limited. And then you can see there's a number of other categories where it, it does um, not have a, a green check mark. Um, net net, you know, what would a perfect solution or a much better solution? There's no perfect solution, a much better solution look like. You know, lots of green check marks across all these, all these columns, plus the additional uh, smaller columns that I left out here. And then on the accessory supported side, it would be really great to have all, success, all accessories that support, you know, this new standard or new protocol. I'm going to hand off to Jocelyn now. Great. Oh, yeah, you have one yes. question from Ms. Sell. Go ahead. Hi, uh, hopefully a quick question. Uh, just on the deterrence part, is there, what evidence is there that this kind of does anything? Because my, my view would be, if someone is intent on tracking someone illegally, telling them you're doing crime is going to do absolutely nothing. So may, what evidence is there that this does anything? So should we be prioritizing that over other things? Or That's a good question. Uh, I don't have data to back up if a... <laughs> excuse me, a text description at time of pairing telling you about the bad things that could happen to you, if yeah. that actually prevents people from doing bad things. Um, we do know that having a pairing registry, though. I did, that would be useful, yeah. Yeah, that, <laughs> that is quite useful. Um, we also know that um, one of the features available, at least on the Apple system, is you can NFC tap on an AirTag, yeah. and it shows the last four digits of the owner's phone number, so it's obfuscated, doesn't show the whole phone number. We also have evidence that that's quite helpful. Okay. Good question. Thanks. Go ahead, Jocelyn. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for the, the opportunity to uh, to talk about uh, uh, our uh, approach to um, anti-stalking prevention, um, anti-stalking, basically. Uh, we have a feature called uh, Scan and Secure. Um, so I'm going to uh, talk about this, and uh, it's a high-level introduction. And uh, I also want to say um, it's, it's a work in progress. Uh, so we we um, we still uh, have a long way, I think, to to really address the the issues, which is um, quite important, as uh, has been nicely explained. Um, so the <clears throat> the approach that we have in our um, mobile application, uh, it's it's a feature. Uh, so you. Uh, no signing is required. You have to install the application. That's one of the of the uh, limitation, I think, of not you know owning a platform. Um, so the the way we um, propose to um, to scan here is a, a manual guided scan. It's uh, a person uh, wanting to check, and it's able to do this using the app. And so the this uh, app, this feature in our app, is uh, going to check for tiles and tile uh, porn accessories. Uh, so after uh, uh, the guided scan, basically, they, uh, there would be a page showing um, the results um, with uh, some product information, like a picture uh, and uh, some information about the, the model. Uh, and then that, that result can be saved, shared. And uh, also, there is a link to some tips how to find the, the, the device or how to what to do if you if you're in that situation where there is a, a device that is not yours, uh, that is uh, following you. All right, next slide, please. So this uh, feature, Scan and Secure, um, is uh, mostly targeted at the uh, survivors of uh, domestic abuse. Uh, so it's a manual scan. So you need to, to be aware of the issue and, and want to detect it. And it also requires an app install if you're not uh, a customer, right? Um, so it's on iOS and Android tile apps. Um, some of the, so the, this, this feature is already released, but some of the features we would like to add or we are considering adding. Uh, the background scan that's been uh, mentioned already. Uh, so of course, uh, there is a trade-off here between false alarms and notification uh, versus uh, being able to 
to um, accurately detect um, these uh, trackers. Um, so the I think the the misuse of of trackers is still a rela uh, the ratio is still like a small portion of the the use cases, but uh, want to avoid having. Uh, uh, daily nuisance in terms of notifications for everybody. So that's a trade-off. Um, then ring detecting tiles. I think that's uh, something that helps, uh, you know, finding uh, the, the, the units. Uh, and uh, of course, one of the important uh, parameter of this uh, feature is to uh, um, avoid the prank. You know, you're uh, someone in a meeting and uh, people uh, being able to ring their units. Um, and so let's Last point is standardization. Uh, so one of the limitation here is that people have to install an app. Uh, and so, and actually many apps uh, potentially, if, if there are multiple um, uh, trackers um, uh, brands that, that you would like to detect. <laughs> so it could be challenging. And I think standardization could be a, a great way to address uh, this uh, issue and others too. Um, that's it, thank you. Okay. I lost my guy to speak. So I can't tell if there's anybody. Um, in the so queue. just in terms of yeah, there's there's no one in the queue, but also yeah, come on up. Just in terms of the time check, we're actually are only five minutes behind despite the chairs blowing at the beginning. So we're doing all right. So okay. thanks. All right. Mallory, did you have a question for uh, Jocelyn? I am playing the part of Mallory for, for the purpose of um, <laughs> everyone's going to get super sick of me. Uh, so, uh, oh, hi, I'm Eva Galperin from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, where I'm the director of cybersecurity. Um, so, uh, one thing you didn't mention is uh, that there is a way of, uh, of turning detection off uh, through an anti-theft uh, mode for your tile. Is that true? What is the point of having detection if someone can turn it off? Can, can you hear me? We can. Oh, I can hear you. OK, that's a very good question. So there is um, a feature to uh, disable tracking with a warning um, in the, the scan and secure application and some other conditions um, that including identity verification and uh, other parameters. So that's uh, an accurate statement. But the person who is being tracked will not know that they are being tracked, correct? If someone turns on anti-theft the mode and then uses it to stalk someone, they will be able to su successfully stalk someone using so your product. They, that's, that's accurate. There are, that's accurate. And there are many, many ways to, to abuse uh, you know all these features that everybody is uh, is uh, trying to implement and uh, um, I must say that um, one of the purpose of being here and uh, in this room and and um, or you know remotely is to make sure that we address all these uh, concerns in a way that is uh, uh, working and sufficient for everybody so I agree and thank you for uh, asking this question. Is there some reason why you left this out of your presentation? So I think we should probably focus here on um, clarifying questions of, of what was presented so that we can get to the part about, should we standardize something? All right, so I'm gonna take a moment to, now that we understand like what the general problem space is, to be more explicit about the threat model we're considering and what scenarios are in scope at all. So we can go to the next slide. So the top level threat that we keep talking about is a stalker using a location accessory uh, to engage in unwanted tracking. And what we're lacking right now is a standardized cross-platform and interoperable way for victims or the targets of unwanted tracking to detect what is happening to them. But I want to take a second to walk through a lot of specific scenarios that could happen that would make it hard for the victim to discover that they're being tracked. And then I'll also mention the proposed mitigations from the internet draft that would address each of those threats. So the first thing is the victim not being aware at all of unwanted tracking. 
Um, and the biggest thing that we can do are the alerts that we mentioned earlier. And so that is if you've got something small on you, it's been placed on you, it's in your jacket, it's in your bag, um, that your phone gets an alert that something has been following you. And the proposed mitigation here is having stable Bluetooth addresses. That way, a, any platform is able to detect something following a victim. But then, if a victim does get an alert, we want to be mindful that they might need help finding it. This has been the motivation for suggesting things like the ability to place sound on item um, or alternate finding hardware. The victim might also find themselves in a situation where they are aware of an increased level of risk to themselves. Um, they're aware of their own life circumstances or someone who might be targeting them. So they might want the ability to not just get alerts, um, but proactively search for them. Having interoperability and this, this, um, a consistent way of broadcasting would make it easier to have um, the ability to scan for items so that the target who expects something can proactively look. The target or the victim, um, similar to someone who knows they might be at increased risk, might also have a suspicion of who the person tracking them is. Um, and so we also want, the, to ha want them to have the ability to identify that person. They shouldn't just find the tag and then have it be like a mystery where it came from. Um, and they might need to take recourse in their lives. We proposed um, including obfuscated owner information as a way to identify someone if you already know in advance who they might be. But then even if it's not that person or if you do know who that person is, the victim might be looking for additional mechanisms of recourse or they might trust someone else to help them achieve that goal. And that target will need the ability to trace the stalker and locate their identity. Having this, um, the serial number visible on the accessory, um, available over NFC or Bluetooth, and maintaining a pairing registry of the serial number with, with the identity of the owner of the device are the mitigations we've proposed to address this threat. Um, and then finally, there is the target not being um, like finding the device. And like once you found it, you don't want to just like know that it's been tracking you. You want to be able to turn it off. Um, and so we also want to make sure we consider like how you get the thing to turn off and stop reporting location. Um, also going to. I realized I skipped one in the middle. That was very important. So I'm going to run back up to it, um, which is if you're the victim and for whatever reason you are unable to receive an alert, we still want you to be able to find the tracker. And so these are people who might not have um, a device that supports giving the alerts. Uh, maybe it's in a bag or a jacket that wasn't near the phone or the device that's able to detect um, the Bluetooth advertisements. Maybe the phone was off or away. Um, and in that case, um, we still want there to be some, some suggestion that the accessory is with you. Um, and the proposed mitigation here is beep on move, which is using that same speaker that's already in the device um, to beep when, when it has been away from its owner for a long time and the thing is moved. This would be like in the teddy bear, the kid might find it because once you pick it up and the kid starts moving, they're going to hear like a beep. Someone was playing it earlier. I heard it in the audience. I heard, I heard the air tag beep going. Someone was doing play sound and the teddy bear would start like <laughs> screaming the little air tag jingle. Um, and then while the, our main focus is on enabling victims to find accessories that are being used to track them, we also want to mention um, that we don't want to introduce new risk of tracking by third parties with Bluetooth scanning abilities across physical distance. So this could be, this could include tracking the owner um, or the target with either the Bluetooth advertisement um, or the serial number broadcast. And so um, we think we've proposed um, address rotation to mitigate this risk. So someone who puts a scanner 
at the bus stop and across the mall can't identify the same person broadcasting the same thing at those two different locations. I will finally mention that there's additional risk if accessories are hacked or if manufacturers um, do not implement um, this, the same kind of um, Bluetooth advertisement in a standardized way. But I want to emphasize that the biggest threat here is, is allowing victims to find the accessories that are like today in the wild being used to track people um, without any standardized or interoperable way of victims detecting these accessories. So those might be threats that we address in the future. So I have a question and I have once again lost my internet connectivity, so I have no idea if there's anybody in the queue, so I'm gonna ask you my question. Um, on the third party scanner piece, um, I think the way that this is presented, it sort of uh, presupposes that there is no other information being broadcast that could be used for tracking outside of the, the Bluetooth address or the serial number. But in the draft, there's this like proprietary payload blob thing, which we have no idea what goes in there. So can you, would you consider that as an additional threat, you know, tracking based on any field that's, that's Yeah, being I think that that is a great point. And we don't want to consider tracking just based on the address. Um, we also want to consider tracking on payload stability. And so that's a great point. Okay. Thanks. Oh, oh, I can see the queue. Okay. Yeah. Hari. Hi, this is Hari with uh, Light360. Uh, what are your thoughts on preventing like false alerts if someone's on a hike, you know, in a group of 10 and everyone gets a false alert saying that they're being tracked just because there's one potential rogue, rogue tag or maybe if someone's on a bus, the same situation? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, but we're really focusing on giving platforms the ability to even detect the accessories at all. Um, and so I think it's a little, it is out of scope or for another conversation, um, how the actual detection logic works. There's a lot of additional, uh, additional considerations there totally. Um, but like the, definitely the emphasis is on can they even be detected at all? I'm not not to get too technical, but I'm just saying that if we if you don't speak about that when this thing does get rolled out and it's an annoyance, it might not have as much as an uptake as if it didn't. So it's nice to consider the side effects so that when it does get rolled out, you know, others don't see it as a, you know, potential. I wouldn't call it a nuisance. I mean, it's very valuable, but if some set of the population finds it annoying, you know, this it could work against it. So it's, it's, I'm just saying it's good to start talking about that early on rather than later on. Yeah, I agree that it's totally a good point to think about. Um, but implementation of the detection is, you know, a separate consideration with sure. different weighing of the, yeah. you know, what, what would be okay. inconvenient or too noisy um, weighed against people's safety. Right. On. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to close the queue. So if you want to be in the queue, please get in it. Um, Eric. Hi, Eric Criscorla. Um, So, I mean, I think we're going to talk about the scope later, so I'm not going to nitpick that right now. But I just want to point out that I think that this last two, last two points are like not quite as clear as one might like. Um, it's not just a matter of non adherent manufacturers say that, you know, someone starts a new network and doesn't adhere. There's also the problem of non adherent manufacturers of, of tags which work with an existing network. So, um, the, the, the understand is that the threat here is not created by um, by the existence of the tags, it's created by the existence of the tracking network itself. And the reason, and, and the fact, and the, the tracking network is what makes it possible to have a cheap device that is used, is used for stalking, right? And so if I can build a device which works with, say, Apple's network, but does not follow this, this thing, then it's usable for stalking, and none of these things work. And so, um, and so it's a, sort of a variant of accessory hacker. So I just want to flag that it's not like, the, the point here is not that like I might build an entirely new tracking network from scratch that doesn't violate it, is that I might build a tag cheaply that still interoperates. Yeah, I think you're totally right. That's a real risk. And like definitely um, one of the things we're trying to capture here um, that people can take advantage of that on the network. Um, but, I, but you know, that's kind of a problem that would be great to address in the future once we're even able to detect the, you know, once we're even able to detect all the normal ones. 
then we can think about how we fix these. I think that's what we're going to talk about later because I don't believe <laughs> Great. Brendan. Hi. Um, I just want to comment on the, the discussions of serial number and pairing registries. And I, I want to point out that those aren't those don't exist now for a really good reason. And I'm really worried about the, the unintended consequences of, of deploying something like that. The whole point of rotating MAC addresses and hiding the serial number is to prevent people from stalking you while you're carrying your keys. So if we go and start advertising these things, we've, we're back to the same place we started. This is incredibly counterproductive if we enable stalking while attempting to fight stalking. Yeah, uh, so totally agree. And that's why we included um, this like second set of risks around like, like the third party scanner. Um, and like the mitigation we've proposed here of like, you know, against like an owner being tracked across space, like because they're broadcasting their serial number um, are two things, um, both that you need to take a physical action in order to initiate the broadcast. Um, so you're not just wandering around with like an air tag, like screaming its cell phone num or its serial number out. Um, it only happens if someone finds the physical object and takes a specific action. Um, and we've also proposed encrypting it. So definitely, um, we acknowledge that's a real risk and do not want to introduce something in the name of safety that just further jeopardizes other people. And, and I mean, I bring this up because this is a real example of something that happened with a certain shoe manufacturer's um, fitness device and and that was a real problem and the, the design has evolved because of that yeah and i think that we want to make sure um that anything that comes out of this doesn't ignore that okay please keep it brief at the mic because uh, we want to be able to move through the agenda chen hi uh, hi, uh chen Yi from at and so um you mentioned the uh, non-compliant manufacturer right that, that's a risk and I would say that I would argue that um, to the problem, original problem, that's probably the biggest risk because say if a stalker, you know, that's the purpose in mind, he, he's going to find some non-confirming, you know, manufacturers to use that instead of you know, the other thing or you can detect it, right? And uh, so I, I think that this is not the, you know, uh, I mean, standardization or technical problem can be solved probably we need to involve legislation. I mean, like, you know, if you got a law, you say, oh, no, all the trackers, you had to conform to some standard, not standard, just like, you know, must be detectable. So I, I just use a form and, and say, you know, you have to emit some signals. I just track it. Oh, there's something with me, right? And I, and I can just, you know, detect something with me and I remove it. Problem solved. Thank you. Yeah, and I think something interesting you mentioned there was like if everyone else is, you know, adherent and then some, you know, someone malicious can choose a non-adherent one, like we're not even to the world where you can choose the adherent one um, or where that's even a choice. And I think once we get there, then we can, you know, all think of what are, what are the, like this, what's the set of possible solutions that can address this set? Harry. So I wanted to continue a little bit on uh, Brendan's point. And so we should be really clear if we are sort of relying on existing databases of serial numbers and owner information, or if we are creating it for this purpose. We have to be really, really sure that we actually need this requirement because creating some of these databases, if, if, if we actually are creating it, is somewhat concerning that the you know a uh, huge amount of information uh, in very centralized locations, um, and the draft does talk about handing it over to the authorities as well. Which I don't know if, if the draft should should say that. Maybe you need to do that business wise, but um, I'm not sure the ITF spec needs to say that. And also, you mentioned like a physical action required in order to pass some information. I I think I read that for NFC, for instance, uh, proximity might be enough. And I would suggest that probably it shouldn't be because it's fairly easy to be close enough to someone's bag, for instance, to, to do an NFC scan. So um, I, I think that, that part does, does require some further thinking. Thank you. Alini. Um, so, so this, 
Okay, so non-compliant devices, there's another whole category, which is actually that by the time this is actually out of the IETF, if there is a standard and it's actually implemented, there's a, a world of legacy devices. And so maybe the place to do all this is not at the device level, but at a different level because, or, or have a very good migration path because otherwise, I mean, otherwise you get into implementation problems, even if people want to do it. Thank you. Gabriel. Hi, so this is in response to something that I think was verbally articulated earlier as a potential uh, mitigation strategy, but of notifying the, the tracking party of the fact that they're conducting illegal activity. And I think Q had a, a very thought provoking question about whether or not that would work. So speaking as a law enforcement officer, um, there's actually a potential benefit to that in the sense that if you want to prosecute them down the road, it might help alleviate any potential um, plausible deniability they have of, oh, I didn't know what I was doing is illegal. And these kinds of uh, notifications can be beneficial when it comes to prosecution later after that is a consideration. Thank you. I'm sorry, Sam, the queue is closed. We're gonna, thank you, Lindsay. We're gonna move back to Brent. Brent and Jonathan for the, yeah. for the scope, yeah. Okay, so let's uh, let's go faster. Um, <laughs> so here's the architecture again we saw earlier. Uh, again, the five different interfaces or protocols that I think are most relevant uh, called out. The ones that I think are in scope, and we debate exactly how much they should be in scope, are highlighted in magenta, circled in magenta. So item uh, A, the Bluetooth advertisement. Uh, there's an asterisk there. I got a supporting slide to talk more about this. Um, that's, I think, mostly in scope. Item D, where you're, you're doing the Bluetooth interface between the accessory and the, the non-owner device to pull down attributes, um, capabilities, and then issuing commands like play sound, user actions. That, I believe, should be in scope. And then finally, the, the server query over the internet to pull down things like images, videos, and get the serial number, um, I believe, should be in scope. So let's we'll hopefully refer back to the slide during the discussion. Let's go to the next slide, if that's OK. Um, this was copied and pasted from the GitHub um, proposed charter. Uh, I'm not going to read all this. So I'm going to summarize the next couple slides. So at a high level, you know, again, we're proposing to uh, have in scope for this working group the three interfaces with the asterisk around the Bluetooth advertisement that we discussed uh, in the previous slide. There's a number of privacy pr um, uh, proposals here about what type of uh, uh, privacy goals we need to have in mind for this working group. Um, and then I'm not going to read those off for brevity. And then finally, I think this has been highlighted a couple times uh, indirectly, but th this is actually a very important point. Um, some of these accessories today probably can't be firmware updated, even if they can be firmware updated. We need to be very mindful of the fact that they have very little memory. They have long battery life. So any new protocol that we define, we need to be very conscious of that to make them um, still act uh, as, as uh, effective products. And then the other consideration, which is called out at least in the internet draft, I don't think we called it out in the charter, is there's probably a discrimination we want to consider on things like a small $20 or $30 location tracker and a $1,000 plus dollar bicycle. Um, one of those is very easy to surreptitiously plant on someone. The other one is a little bit more challenging. Next slide, please. <laughs> <laughs> Just last year. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, the proposal for the program of work is to standardize those interfaces we talked about in two slides ago visually. Uh, I think we also want to specify practices. This is important wording here on things like deterrence and the pairing registry. It is not intended to be in scope to implement and design a pairing registry, um, but more along the lines of recommendations to companies that are implementing tracking networks that this is a helpful thing to do. So some wording and best practices around um, that is what's intended by the major bullet two. And then of course, along with what is needed for item one to allow accessory makers to implement the protocol, 
there is some, uh, obviously, because it's an end-to-end -end protocol between a device and the accessory, what may be needed on the platform side to implement that too. Next slide, please. Um, and again, we're going to debate this more, but this is copied and pasted from the, the draft charter. Um, I don't think we, in this initial working group, want to standardize in the protocols for the end-to-end, -end, the entire system that includes the Bluetooth crowdsourcing, unwanted tracking detection. I think furthermore, I think for the beginning of this work, we should focus on what is needed for the accessory makers to allow, allow cross-platform, cross-accessory interoperability. The detection um, algorithms on distance travel, time, et cetera, I, we're proposing that's out of scope for this first working group. Um, I think Eric said it well. Um, uh, you know, the in incremental improvements are, are a good way to go. And I guess we're proposing that starting with that is a great initial first step. Um, I know we're going to talk more about the last two bullets so, so, uh, and malicious trackers. So um, the, the first bullet there, mechanisms for detecting accessories that do not implement the protocol, proposing that to be out of scope. Um, and then finally, mechanism to detect whether an accessory has correctly implemented the protocol or a test that it has implemented the protocol, proposing that's out of spec. I have a follow-up question, because I don't fully understand this, brand new to IETF community. I don't really understand the role of certification in how this fits into this whole world here. Um, and then second off, uh, and the email discussions about malicious trackers, one of the things that was mentioned to me yesterday is do we even have a clear definition today of what a malicious tracker is? Uh, I can posit a couple different you know, categories of malicious trackers. Um, anyway, I'm, I won't, in brevity, I won't go into that, but there's, there's a couple different categories, some that are very, very impactful and meaningful for what we're talking about today, and some that are malicious, but maybe have a different definition than this working group, if formed, cares about. Great. Great, thank you. Oh, I think we should Bluetooth probably. advertisement. Oh. Can I just go to that slide 20? Anyone? <laughs> Great. Um, so this is in the proposed uh, internet draft, um, just as reference. So this is one, it's the, the structure of the header of the Bluetooth advertisement that we suggest would be a great um, proposal for standardizing how unwanted tracking can be detected across platforms. Uh, you can see in the bottom, uh, Alyssa mentioned this, other people mentioned it, there's a proprietary blob there. Uh, what's needed for unwanted tracking detection, reliable detection, and to support the actions like play sound is the first 15 bytes, uh, 0 through 14. That blob is, was left there because I understand that manufacturers, we understand that manufacturers may want to put additional information in to support things like crowdsource finding. Uh, one really clear example of that is the encryption keys for crowdsource finding are quite long. We're talking 224-bit keys. That'll take up a lot of the left, the what's rest of that very small Bluetooth payload. So I would imagine it's hard pressed and maybe too much to consider in the first version to mandate the specific uh, format and values in those that blob. But I think it'd be really great to uh, have this working group consider what the privacy uh, protections of that, that data blob need to be. Things like it should, it should not have a serial number that's static for long periods of time or anything that's static for long periods of time. I feel like maybe that's a potentially good compromise on uh, making sure that we're not creating another privacy problem accidentally. Okay, Tom, then. Okay, thanks. Um, we're gonna turn to Jonathan and then we're gonna open the floor to start talking about everything Brent just discussed in the charter and whatnot. So go ahead, Jonathan. We cannot hear you. I think you've got to put it. He's there. Yeah. Yes, I think you're not. It's not sending. Yeah, you need to um, hit the send audio button. Now try again. No, we still can't hear you. It's probably local on your side. <laughs> Bluetooth. There you go. Okay, we can oh, hear you. There we go. Yeah, I was going to say it's the Bluetooth standards problem. 
Um, so thanks everybody for bearing with me on that. Uh, I'm Jonathan Brown. I'm in the standards legal group at Apple. I've been fortunate to work with Brent and other members of the Apple team on this effort. And you know, the, the purpose here is, you know, Apple's collaborating with Google to lead development of this specification um, to discourage unwanted tracking and you know help help really benefit our users and make sure this technology is used as intended. The purpose of Apple's involvement here is not to license patents, um, but since some of the protections that we're building into this specification are covered by Apple inventions, we wanted to make sure that we're fully complying with Apple's IETF IPR policy by disclosing uh, and making a, a RAND commitment and just being totally transparent that we are making available for license any patents that Apple does have um, that might be needed to implement this standard. So, you know, as the bullet says here, um, you know, we, we did submit disclosures of the patents that, that we thought might be essential. I mean, the standard's just starting, so we're not sure what it's gonna look like at the end, but we wanted to get that out uh, right away so people had that information. Um, we've made similar RAND commitments. This is reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. Uh, RAND commitments to license on other standards over the years. Uh, Apple's very committed to uh, RAND principles. We have a whole web page on this. Uh, and, you know, again, you know, th this effort is not about licensing patents. It's about making sure the standard can't be widely implemented and that users are as protected as they can be from, from unwanted tracking. Um, so I'm happy to take, uh, you know, questions, um, you know, that people might have on this to clear up any confusion, um, but uh, you know, happy to happy to be here to to say that we're fully complying with the IPR policy. Thank you. Um, can we go back to the chart, the first charter slide? So uh, we're going to turn to the queue. The queue is very long. Um, please keep your comments brief and to the point and focused on uh, what's being proposed in terms of the charter for this um, proposed working group and what you think it does well or not well. Um, and please be ready to speak if you're the next person in line. Yaron. Yaron Schiff, uh, I'd like to highlight another perspective on, on this whole effort. The main drawback from a product point of view of each of these trackers is that it's limited to its own ecosystem. What we're doing here with very good intentions and very good reasons is break down some of these walls between the ecosystems. And call me paranoid, but I think that once we start doing that, the next step could very well be that the walls are taken down and we end up with a universal tracking network, uh, which may or may not be a good thing depending on where you stand, uh, but it's something to keep in mind. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. Tommy Polly, Apple. Um, so I was just going to make two comments on the scope here. One, um, I, I appreciate the comment you made about having the payload be in scope. Um, you know, I think we may want to then update some of the diagrams of what things are covered because I feel like the payload then kind of gets into a little bit of what is even happening on the normal uh, detection. So we want to make sure that the charter would include that because as has been mentioned before, that does have a very important privacy implication. Um, and then when we talk about what's out of scope, I guess is that two slides from now? I don't know. Um, there is the case that was brought up before, um, I think Ecker brought up, of you have a, you know, someone who's legitimately in Apple's Find My Network who, you know, just does like a bad job or la they let themselves be hacked or they, you know, put, or they're putting stuff in that is worse or they're rotating things more often. I would appreciate if we can find a way to, you know, carefully make sure that is in scope such that uh, obvious subversion of this um, is at least, you know, detectable. Like there are many ways you could technically do it of saying like, okay, you know, everyone around all the devices around this see this thing is not near its owner and it's rotating it super frequently. Like that looks really sketchy. Let's all report that. Like that feels like a discussion that a working group should be able to have and not leave that out of scope. Watson. Uh, Watson Ladd, Akamai. Uh, I think this is very good work. I do have a minor, minorish quibble. I think when we look at the privacy goals of the charter, 
it's kind of underspecified. There's a whole bit where it says like indirection must be secure. It doesn't really say some of the things I think we discussed and all want, like unless there's a device that's co-moving, the privacy properties don't change from the usual tracking protocol. That I think should be in there. I also think that in terms of like the scope limitations, it was really clear when I saw that diagram. It was not clear when I read the charter. I'm sorry, I don't have text to propose to fix that. Yeah. TKG. Yeah, can I talk? Sorry, Daniel's next. I didn't write my name, but I have been staying here. <laughs> No, just say a few are, two words. Are you not able to log in? Yeah, there's I'm a very ready. long queue. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Con Gilmore. Okay. Uh, ACLU. So uh, these tracking networks are significantly dangerous. I, I am fully aligned with the idea that we should be thinking about how to do this and we should not have, um, we should be discouraging proprietary tracking networks as well, so that we can actually have some insight into this. Um, <clears throat> I am concerned about this uh, scope statement. Putting the actual third party tracking network thing out of scope seems like a mistake to me. Um, the, what happens in that third party tracking uh, network is gonna have significant implications on who can be tracked and in different ways. And I think we need to be thinking about that. I think it's a mistake to, to, to define that out of scope, although I understand you know, from an engineering perspective, we'd like to have uh, bite-sized problems. Um, and I also just wanted to highlight that the device registration, the pairing registration thing, you know, uh, has significant other concerns. Uh, if I can grab somebody's uh, bag and it happens to have a tag in it, and then suddenly I can take that information and go to the pairing registry and get information about who that person is, that's, a, that's another problem that we don't want to be creating as we attempt to solve these problems. So I really think that we need to think about the systemic impacts here and not just focus on, oh, here's a neat thing we can do at the Bluetooth layer if we assume devices have Bluetooth and a speaker. Thanks, Gregory. Uh, Gregory Maxwell. Uh, I, uh, in, from reading the charter, it wasn't clear to me if mechanisms to disable trackers were out of scope. I mean, they may be advisable or inadvisable, but and maybe part of a particular proposal or not, but it wasn't clear to me if they're in the scope of the charter or not, like to disable trackers at a shelter location or at someone's home when they don't use trackers by, you know, beaconing a crowdsourcing uh, suppression beacon or something. Do you, have an, do you, want, do you want to speak to that? I, yeah, I can. So uh, how do I think? I think there's two ways that I think about that. Um, one is if you have physical access to the tracker, uh, you definitely want to have a way to disable it. I don't think those disablement mechanisms need to be um, as a protocol in within scope of the charter, but certainly that the uh, charter should, or should cover that there's a, a way to disable it if you have physical access. And we yeah. need to make that very clear. So, so for physical access, I'd say that it's often too late. It's already reported you. So if you think about like at my home, I don't want anyone's trackers, you know, if they get dropped off, they're reporting back or at a shelter, for example. So you might imagine a mechanism where you have a device persistently broadcasting, don't report, don't report at this location. And that's a mechanism that could exist. It may be a bad idea, it might be a good idea, but I think it should, discussion of it should be perhaps in scope for the, for the working group. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Uh, my, I wasn't able to sign in, so I stood up after the fifth person okay. was in queue. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Kathleen Moriarty, I'd just like to make sure, as I mentioned before earlier in the discussion, that we're precise on the use case to be able to make progress. Um, and the discussion within the chat really emphasized that point. If we don't out of scope things like dementia and tracking children, which could be something like, um, you know, a device that has knowledge to all parties it's just a different use case. So I'd like to make sure we, we scope exactly what's proposed here and those other pieces are not considered at least yet because it would prevent progress and you'll have the same conversation a million times. Thank you. Just the, can you state the, what you think the, the functional scope limitation should be, not on a use case basis? Yes, so uh, tracking and preventing surveillance or um, uh, the 
for the device. So it's more the, um, uh, your lost device and, I'm sorry. You know what, I had this written down earlier, but there's- Or maybe put it in the chat if you wanna think about it for a minute. I'm locked out of it. Oh, of course. Yeah, so- <laughs> Have your neighbor put it in the chat, apparently <laughs> that's the protocol. So tracking um, device that is yours, preventing unknown surveillance. Okay. And then the other two that would be potentially out of scope would be tracking stolen items mm -hmm. and tracking elderly and children because there's different considerations. Okay, thank you. Nick. Yeah, thanks. I, I think it's extremely important work. Um, on the, I, I, I sent some comments on list about the scope, about trying to be clear about the privacy goals and to be trying to be clear about the making the detection and notification trauma informed. On, on this not in scope section, I, I am questioning the, the ruling at a station out of scope. I understand that might not be the first milestone and, and maybe it's good practice for us to list milestones in, in order, um, but it does seem like attestation will be useful and so that it would be reasonable to include that in scope to try to anticipate um, some of the concerns about um, devices that are designed in a malicious way. Thanks, Sam. Oh, I thought it, I thought it was after Nick, what happened? Uh, Nick, Nick just oh, apparently I disappeared off the queue, but I'm gonna claim my, <laughs> my... I, I, I swear to you, uh, uh, my, my colluding <laughs> proximate neighbor. I believe you. Me. I believe you. Um, uh, yeah. uh, Ted Hardy, apparently ghost member of the queue. Um, I, I got up to say, I, I think this is a very important problem. I think the charter has written is, uh, is eliminating a whole bunch of ways of thinking about it and focusing on one in problematic ways. Uh, as Eric Roscorla pointed out earlier, the functional mechanism that this works by is having a device uh, with a network interface that other uh, nearby systems can detect and which then collude to provide a certain amount of information to an upstream database. Instead of looking at that, this proposes setting up a different proximity-based network to inform other proximate users that this is the case. Uh, and I believe by ruling out any solution which focuses on the first set of proximate um, uh, devices and their information sent up to this database. Uh, it is eliminating a, a set of possible answers here, which might be both simpler and more appropriate to avoid other kinds of tracking. Um, I, I'm very much aware of the, the concerns that uh, Daniel Con gilmore has raised, and I agree with them. I believe that historically the, the IETF has been very, very careful to say to both proponents, are you willing to give up change control? And I do not believe, as I read this charter, that critical elements of the change control are being given up because you are asking us not to make changes to the devices and not to make changes to the business model, which requires this collusion. As a result, I believe this should be completely rethought, despite how important the, pro the, um, the problem is. If you, if you limit the solution space to something that lets the current trackers continue to work, you probably haven't eliminated the problem. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to close the queue. Sam. Sam Weiler. I saw a paper a couple of weeks ago that looked at how to build or modify a tracker to subvert these protections. I think this was at PETS. I think it was as simple as rotate the MAC address more often, right? And the limitation here to not do attestations, I'm very supportive of. That way lies madness. But how are we going to fix the problem of someone modifying the device to not emit the protocol that we're expecting? That is a great question. I don't think we know. And I, I think it's a really hard problem. And I think what I proposed, which is maybe not enough, but starting with clear definitions of what a malicious tracker is, might be a good way to get moving forward. I think Tommy had an alternate perspective of maybe that's not enough. And Eric, I think, right. <laughs> said the same thing as you. We need to go further, but that, that is a hard problem. So yeah. your, your first limitation here about um, detecting, I don't care so much about detecting as preventing. Jonathan. Jonathan Hoyland's Cloudflare. I, let, let, let's presuppose, and I, I don't think this is true, but let's presuppose that I trust Apple. And I think, <laughs> sorry. 
Um, let's presuppose that I do, and I, I, I don't mind if there's some like very small tracking network that doesn't comply with this, but I'm like, Apple, they're probably going to not do bad stuff. Um, <laughs> like, you know, just, just for argument's sake. Keep going. And <laughs> if, if we have the requirement that says a signature must be included in the unwanted tracking thing, then uh, we could require the, the tracking networks to implement some kind of authentication because what is very likely to happen, and I suspect has already happened, is someone will say, I'm going to build a device that will connect to Apple's network and transmit all this and be tracked through Apple's network, but doesn't do any of the good apple stuff. Uh, okay, so I, I, I suspect. So if we say, actually, you must include a signature, then all these device manufacturers won't be like, oh, having you know, 256 bits is just so expensive, we can't possibly store that. Um, so if we, we, if we require a signature in the charter, I, I think we might actually have some hope of getting somewhere. Thank you. Ben. Ben Schwartz, Meta. Uh, so I, I, as, as others have said, the privacy requirements in the charter are, I think, woefully incomplete. In particular, they don't seem to talk about privacy protections for the tag owner uh, when used correctly. I think that's a very important thing to put in the charter. I think it's also important that the charter include some discussion of analysis and account for the possibility of failure. In, indeed, maybe like highlight the option to fail, because I, I don't think that it's, ob it's certainly not obvious to me that the proposed mechanism can be, can be implemented in a way that is safe for all the different users of, of the network. It's not clear to me, for example, that there, is a, there exists a rotation frequency that somehow is acceptable to all the different parties who are, who are responsible, some of whom would benefit from a faster rotation, some of whom would benefit from a slower rotation. So uh, I would... I don't want this working group to be set up to to charge ahead despite all obstacles and produce something even if it's harmful. Thanks, Eric. So, um, on the one hand, I think this is a very important and serious problem, as has been flagged by a number of people. Um, uh, on the other hand, I think that this approach is not good. Um, so let me try to lay out why I think it's not great. Um, so first thing, a microphone. So I think the first point I'd like to make is that, as I think DKG pointed out, this proprietary blob is a critical part of the privacy surface. And without looking at, understanding what's in the proprietary blob, it's completely impossible to assess what the properties of the system are in terms of privacy. And so ruling that out of scope, um, simply like does not give you any assurance whatsoever that the resulting system has any privacy properties whatsoever. And I think you've, been, you, you've done a little bit of hand-waving about what one might say about the proprietary blob, but like, um, you know, uh, uh, I think attempting to create some set of description about that and requirements is extraordinarily difficult to persuade yourself that, that those rules are sufficient to provide privacy. So, I mean, you know, you say, well, maybe it's not static, but what if, but like, gee, maybe it's like rotating on a, on a, on a fixed, predictable pattern or whatever. So like trying to deter describe that, I think is gonna be very difficult. Um, uh, second, um, as I pointed out earlier at the microphone, um, you know, I think we have to deal with the problem of non-conforming devices. As I said, the issue here um, is created by the existence of this colluding network, not by the tags themselves. Um, and um, while you know, step zero, no doubt, will be, um, you know, if we, it would be in fact a huge improvement if the commercially available devices were conformant with this protocol. Um, by protocol, um, the absolute next step will be someone goes and fabs a bunch of $2 devices that comply with the protocol in terms of being findable, but do not comply with these things. And so one really has to think like more than one step ahead when we're designing security systems. So like we don't like, you know, build a wall over here with a door over here. Um, uh, um, third, um, these IPR terms are like woefully inadequate. Um, uh, I see they are, they are RAND. Um, like the idea that one cannot conform with this without paying Apple a, li a licensing fee. Um, is like not reasonable. Um, the de defensive suspension clause in here that basically says, you know, that uh, that you can't implement this without promising never to sue Apple for any kind of patent infringement, and then you have to pay them a licensing fee is like double unreasonable. Um, so if the ITF has to adopt this, um, really this had to be RAN Z terms, not these RAN terms. Um, finally, I want to tie those two points together, which is 
Um, we, we, the end point game here is to design a system that, when totally put together, provides privacy for the user. And that has to include whether or not we standardize those, the proprietary blob things that actually enable the tracking, providing meaningful privacy. And in order to do that, that has to be patent free. And so if that is all entirely out of the scope of the charter, and thus is out of the scope of Apple's patent commitments, then it's not clear that one can even do that, because it's possible that every possible way of doing that reads is read on by Apple's patents. And so to put those together, the point is that that entire thing is using the scope to pull in those patent commitments. So um, I think it's very to close, I think it's very important to do something here. But the word, even worse than doing nothing would be the IETF to publish a specification, which nominally solved this problem, solved only a tiny piece of it, left um, real privacy problems, and then everyone goes around and says, we've implemented RFC, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and says mission accomplished, and people are unaware that privacy problems persist. So um, I think there's something to do here, but I think it has to be radically rethought. Thanks, Siobhan. Hi, um, Siobhan Saheb, a Brave Browser. Um, yeah, I also mentioned in the chat that this idea of an opaque blob um, kind of makes it really hard to talk about what privacy guarantees we should have in that opaque, in that opaque blob. So um, yeah, I don't, I don't know what we can say about that. Um, and um, yeah, and I also kind of agree that um, like this, this first line, this first bullet point doesn't really make too much sense and constrains us in, what, in the threat modeling that we can do. Um, and we should be doing that. Um, and also the last point was that it's, I think there's some, somewhere in the draft you say that you should be sending the last four digits of the phone number or some obfuscated way of um, sending the email address. And it just seems like if anyone can request that, um, then like, that sounds like a bad idea. Um, and if you want to do that, then we should cryptographically enforce that you can only get that um, you know, after or n pings or something like that. Um, but just as it stands, if I can just scan and get that, that seems like a bad idea. Thank you. David. David Skenazi, Google. Um, speaking as an individual contributor, I don't work on this specifically at Google. Um, Want to first completely agree with the goals. Like, yes, absolutely, we need this. Um, and then Similarly, I want, as many people in the queue before me, I think the, the scope is probably a bit too small. In general, you know, at ITF, keeping the scope as small as possible is a better recipe for success. But I think leaving kind of this third party network that is such a load bearing part of the privacy properties here out of scope uh, risks us n not solving the actual problem. So. I would say this is on the right track. There's a lot of great things here, uh, but we, should, we need to improve, improve the scope and widen it in that direction. Hi, Stephen Farrell. Uh, I'm going to agree with David, Ecker, uh, Ted, DKG. Um, so hash include those. Uh, <laughs> I, the additional point I'd make, I think, is that you know, there's, through the pandemic, there was experience with more Bluetooth-based stuff. Uh, in that case, there might have been an excuse for rushing something out the door without thinking about efficacy. I don't think we have that excuse here. Um, so I, I think, in, you know, exceptionally, if, if a working group charter uh, gets written for this, I think it should require evidence of efficacy before we uh, finish the work in the working group. Thanks. Andrew. Hi, <clears throat> Andrew Campling. Um, I agree with Kathleen's earlier point about being really clear and have a very tight use case is important. I think the challenge though, is if we ignore the other use cases that we might break them to solve this use case. So on the one hand, we need it to be very tightly focused to make it solvable. But on the other hand, if we make it tightly focused, there will be unintended consequences that will be easy to ignore. And Rather helpfully, Stuart Card in the chat described it better than I could because he pointed out that uh, if the thief steals my luggage, then I'm the malicious tracker in their terms. Um, and I kind of want to keep that tracking running because that's why I bought a large number of air tags in the first place. Thank you, Apple. Um, so there are mutually exclusive use cases here um, and there's no easy solution to that. Um, and I put in the chat earlier that I think RFC 8890 suggests 
when that happens, you need multi-stakeholder engagement to weigh the trade-offs and decide whose use case is more important. Um, but this is an important problem, but it's not easy. So I guess that's why you're here. Thank you. I'll, I'll echo what Eva said earlier. You know, uh, my personal opinion is people are more important than belongings and we should focus on protecting people. Thanks. Yeah. My name is Bachat Sarikaya. My question is, I think it's very simple. <laughs> you, the charter says we're going to develop a new protocol and I'm a protocol engineer. So I want to know what level protocol are we going to de develop? Is it IP layer? Is it transport layer? Is it app lay application layer? Do you have that? Have you thought about it? The charter text. Uh, I'm probably not the best person to give you a very concrete answer to that question. <laughs> yeah. It, so we're just we're looking at the text right now, um, and it's non-specific, yeah. as you can see. <laughs> so we'd have to clarify that. Uh, Q Mysel, I have two points to make. Uh, my first is not to continue the Apple bashing which has been going on, but um, <laughs> if you take a small drill bit to an air tag, you can completely disable the speaker in it. So this, whatever output comes out of this working group should probably also include some physical security considerations on how these devices function. Um, my second point is there was a point raised that uh, tracking of children and elderly people should be out of scope. Uh, I don't have anything to say about elderly people, but on children, I, ha I am unfortunately young enough that I have grown up in a time where parents can easily track their children without children knowing about it or consenting to this, and I have had to deal with this myself. Come talk to me later, I'm happy to share more details. Um, but I, the, the use case of someone who doesn't have a phone or someone who is too young to be technically literate enough to understand what's going on uh, should not be out of scope and there should be ways for someone who does not have any technology or does not have technology that's not controlled by a third party such as a child to be able to know that someone is tracking them without their consent probably their parents thank you anything else you want to say or jonathan before we move i mean Jonathan, do you want to address? You have any final thoughts, sure. Jonathan? Okay. Yeah, yeah. To, to Eric's points on, on licensing, you know, committing to RAND terms doesn't require Apple to charge people, you know, for essential patents. And, and that's, not, that's not the intent here of this effort. You know, the typical situation is that, you know, once Apple's commitment is made, it's there and no licenses are, are ever consummated. You know, if a particular implementer has questions about whether they might in particular need a license, then they can contact us. There's information in the disclosure itself, how to contact us. Um, you know, another thing to note is some of the technology here is used in other contexts. So when it comes to Apple dealing with other large companies, we obviously need to um, be sensitive to that and protect ourselves in that context. So that's, you know, part of the reason why this defensive suspension clause is there. And, you know, the sort of RAND commitment that we're making here is, is very typical uh, in standard setting context. And the other thing to note is, you know, think to yourself, you know, how likely is it for Apple to, to you know, go after people for trying to protect users? And I, you know, just kind of leave that question out there for you, you know, with Apple being very um, committed to protecting users, committed to privacy protections and, and that sort of thing. So I'm happy to talk offline if you have additional questions. Okay. So, um, you know, sure. I appreciate that these are that you're, you're delimiting the outer bounds of what Apple, Apple might do, but it's perfectly possible if you, you make a patent statement, which is much more um, generous than the one you've made. Lots of people do. It's very common in other contexts. We've seen this for Codex like Opus. So, um, so while it's not a, while you're not requiring Apple to charge, you're also not excluding the possibility of Apple to charge. And what I'm asking Apple to do is to make the kind of commitment we see Cisco or Juniper routinely make about um, full free licensing, rather than please call Apple and let's tell us the terms. Yeah, I, I appreciate okay. that. Opus actually is one I looked up, and it it does have many many brand commitments exactly in line with this. Uh, this one, but uh, yeah, no, I appreciate that. 
Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, you guys, you can sit down. You don't need to stand there anymore. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for all the thoughtful comments. <laughs> yeah, um, thanks a lot. And thank you, everyone, for the very um, constructive discussion. So we're going to move into the BOF questions. Um, the, we've had a lot, of, a lot of opinions offered, obviously, and we're not going to rehash um, what has been said thus far. What we do need to do is gather some data from uh, people who are here in this meeting today to help the area directors, um, you know, figure out what to do next and to get a sense from the community of what they think the path forward is, uh, whether chartering a working group uh, in this area is a good idea or not. So some of these might seem, you th think you know what the answer is or whatever, but we're gonna do, we're gonna use the show of hands tool just to have the, have the data gathered. Um, so next. Hopefully you're, here. You're signed in. hopefully you've signed in and scanned in and the network is stable enough so that we can actually use that. But we actually have a, we have a list, a number of questions. They're very common uh, BOF questions that you see in the how to run a successful BOF. We've actually got a pre-question though that, that we came up with on the fly that I'm going to do, well, I think we should do it. at the end. Well, uh, I think we should do it after the other charted ones. Okay. All right, cool. Sorry, I can jump in there and I've Sorry. hopefully got these all cut and pasted in here. Yeah, okay. Does the community think the problem statement, okay. that one? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, you can put it on, there we go. So while we're rallying kind of for the poll, everyone make sure you're logged in here. <laughs> yeah, and if, if you start having trouble, just come to the mic. <laughs> okay, so here's the first question, which is, um, does the community think the problem statement is clear, well-scoped, solvable, and useful to solve? If your answer to that is yes, raise your hand. If your answer to that is no, select do not raise hand. <laughs> there's 154 people in the chat room and there's 85 participants in the poll so far. I guess, uh, sorry, you're not, I, you're, you're not obligated to participate, but you can hopefully see the numbers up there as well. Daniel Khan Gilmore, I just want to point out that the way that you phrased this, uh, if we disagree with any of yes. these things, indeed, you yes. say do not raise hand. Correct, yeah. And I think it's good that we got a lot of specifics on that from the queue already, so. Um, Nikita, is this a logistical question that you have or a substantive question? Or no question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think we're just wait. I'm just waiting for the numbers to stop. <laughs> going once, going twice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So 31 raised hand. 74 did not raise hand. For a total of 105. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I think we, I think we, unless you want us to. Okay, okay. Um, so, yeah, okay, so this one, we're, I don't, we're not going to use the poll, um, yeah. but it would be helpful to know, uh, should there be a working group chartered in this area, um, who would be willing to contribute drafts? Could you uh, raise your hand, your physical hand, or um, write into the, into the chat that you would, if you're remote, if you would be willing to contribute drafts. So we up here know where some of you work. And so like Apple, uh, Google, uh, some of the um, like CDT and others, there's, there's like 10 people raising their hands. And they're, hard, they're hardware people, software people, and web people all raising their hands. So that's all good. It's across the... Yeah, I mean, I saw at least a dozen hands in the room. Um, yeah. How about review drafts? Man, yeah, that's like 50 people. <laughs> okay, great. And in terms of implementing, obviously no one's committing to anything because we don't even know the design of the thing we're talking about, but 
you have an interest in potentially implementing standards that come out of this working group. Apple, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so that's like, yeah, like six or so, yeah. Um, Tile and Chipolo in the in the chat as well. Okay, so this one we're gonna do a poll question. So there's, we're gonna do this poll question, and then we're gonna do a follow up, uh, um, you know, not templatized poll question about. If the charter was, if the if the scope was different, how would you feel about it? So we're going to do this one first, and then we'll do the, we'll do the refinement second. So, is there support to form a working group with the proposed charter, assuming discussed changes will uh, will be made? Obviously, we didn't we didn't really settle on a specific set of discussed changes. So I think we can say, if you like the charter as is, and you and you support forming a working group, please raise hand. Um, if you do not, please select do not raise hand. All right, going once, going twice, we are done. Uh, yeah, 34 raised hands, 61 did not raise hand for a total of 95. Okay, yeah, why don't we uh, just, can you go to the next slide and then put the poll up so people don't get confused? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Well, actually, that is confusing, isn't it? Maybe we should. We should. We should go back. Go. Maybe just go back to buff question number two, just so nobody is. There we go. Perfect. Okay. 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 So, given that obviously we had a lot of discussion about potentially different scopes for this charter, including bringing in the whole uh, finder network, um, different use cases, attestation, and so on, um, we wanted to just get a sense of whether there's support to work on a charter that addresses some of the problems discussed today. <laughs> um, that has a broader scope. <laughs> you know we're going to call on you. <laughs> going once, going twice. Just in case it wasn't a joke, does somebody really want to get to the microphone and say why? No, seriously. No, seriously. If it was a joke, just say it was a joke and we can move on. But you, actually, you don't have to say anything. Never mind. I'm sorry. I apologize. Okay. So, for the record, that was 97 hands raised and one hand <laughs> did not get raised. Okay. Then I think we have one more question. So, this is the opposite question. Um, if you feel you ready for the ready for the poll. We're getting the poll. Uh, sorry? Today. Why don't we say, like, today? I don't know. I, we're, we're not getting that much additional information at this point, but, like, it's in the, it's in the RFC, so we're asking the question. Uh, if you feel that a working group... I, actually, actually, no, let's do this differently. Let's do this differently. Sorry. 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 Stop the poll. Stop the poll. Um, I, think, I think we should do, like that the IETF shouldn't do work in this area. Is that useful? Okay. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Are you volunteering? 
was in this area. Let's see how much people love that. No, because I think we already got that. That's what, that's what the last question was, right? That was, we're trying to ask the opposite question. Okay, so if you feel the IETF should not do work in this area, stop. This is it's a bad idea. We don't need to address this problem space. There's too many downsides. Whatever reason you think, you should raise your hand. Otherwise, you can do not raise hand. <laughs> I better be a different person. <laughs> okay, all right. That's good. Going once, going twice. All right, we're done. So there were three raised hands for that and 93 not raised. Uh, does anybody who raised their hand want to get up and talk about it? Or, or remote, if you're remote. Go ahead, Michael. Um, so I think it presupposes that the, the question presupposes that the IETF results will be effective for the participants that um, need to be involved. And so while I think we have the security clue and the networking clue, and we can argue that it's going over the internet and so somehow we're involved, um, and we have a precedent you know, in the form of the DRIP working group about doing things over Bluetooth, um, I remain unconvinced that um, we have the, the right set of people who are actually going to implement. So I think most of us, our guests, are not going to be in a position to implement any of this, and I'm not convinced we have running code people in the room. I'd love to be wrong, but that's why I didn't raise my hand or didn't not whatever. Thank you. That's helpful. Thanks, Joel. Uh, Joel Yeagley, uh, raise my hand because I've gone back and forth on this, but like ultimately, uh, pervasive monitoring is an attack. I do not see mm -hmm. how these platforms can be. Um, safely used without enabling that functionality. And I don't think we should be a participant in that. Thank you. Roman, over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm uh, the security area AD kind of overseeing this boss. So I just wanted to wrap up all the conversation that we had realizing, wow, there was a diversity kind of a, a feedback here. So the first thing I want to say kind of top line, thank you for all the new participants that came here to the IETF to discuss what is very, very uh, clear as an important kind of topic. So thank you kind of for coming here. And I realize there's a lot of perspectives on this. So the other thing I very much appreciate is the level of professionalism with which we were able to have this conversation to figure out, uh, to figure out ultimately what, what to do here. Uh, and lastly, of course, a lot of flexibility on how we kind of kicked it off with how some of the IT uh, is working. You know, in balance with how we did this poll, I think we have a pretty strong kind of signal on, how, on what, to do, uh, what to do next. Uh, you know, I will colloquially say, I think what I heard from, from the various polls is that there is strong interest to do work on something in this space in the ITF, but what we should not do is exactly what we presented here. And so there is a need to step back a little bit and refine uh, exactly kind of how to approach this problem, how to kind of scope it appropriately. But what I did hear very, very strongly is that there are people in this room that want to continue kind of to work on that problem and they are willing to do that. These were kind of very kind of large numbers. And what I also heard was that there was interest on the implementation side. So I think what we have here is a very successful BOF in the sense that it indicated that there is interest to work on this very hard problem. And what we got to do is step back, refactor and get the scope exactly right. And I think in the, the, the follow-up kind of steps are please join the mailing list. Let's continue kind of having this conversation. Uh, I won't kind of say anything kind of beyond that to kind of preclude what those next steps might be, but it's clearly going to be charter iteration to find find the right way to approach this in the ITF. Thank you for everyone's kind of engagement on this very, very important topic. Thanks. Bob, you get the last word. <laughs> I know, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, if I can just summarize what the previous person said, I think it would be great to have another BOF. I think it's a very interesting topic. I think we're a long way from actually 
being ready to form a working group because we don't really know what we're going to do yet and whether we can do something that is actually makes the world better or just different. I'm not sure yet. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. We're done. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Going to murder the knock because that was.